So they're on. They're on uh, <laughs> is, that, is that still true? Is it yeah, still true? Yeah. It's not changed in the last week or two. Doctor Dillon would tell you better. Yeah. So no, guys, no. we are live now. We are live now. Okay, guys. You want to? Okay. One was joined. Very good. Okay. Now I welcome you all to the third uh, UPA webinar, and. Uh, this is being broadcast on the YouTube channel. And the topic of this webinar is what not to miss in ankle injuries. We're happy to uh, have today with us three renowned foot and ankle surgeons who would be enumerating their vast skills and experience on the topics they'll be speaking on. We will have three talks each, uh, uh, one talk each by one of the faculty. During the talks, we will not entertain any questions post talks we will entertain questions so have your questions put on to the number that has been provided there's a specific moderator of the questions who will then read out the questions at the end of these talks dr apurva garwal please yeah good evening friends Unmute. i welcome you all on awesome. the behalf of up orthopedic association during the talks we will not entertain any questions post talks we will I welcome you all for this third webinar of UP Orthopedic Association. I am thankful to all the speakers who have given the time to us. Dr. Anup Agrawal worked hard to arrange this webinar. And I am also thankful to Dr. Jamal for arranging the speakers to this webinar. Now, I request Dr. Anup Agrawal to kindly start the meeting. Uh, we have with us Secretary IOA, Dr. Atul Shivastav. I'll request him to say a few words to start with. Well, welcome all. And it's a fantastically charted out webinar on what to miss, not what not to miss in ankle injuries. And as Jamal said, we have the rock star, the Indian rock star, leading our path, Dr. Mandeep Singh Dillon, along with Ashtosh, Ashish, Dr. Arun Kapoor, and Yasir Siddiqui. And welcome Dr. Ming and Dr. Jamal to this fruitful webinar. Okay, let me just introduce the faculty and we can just proceed. First, uh, uh, it, I welcome Dr. Gaurisan Travendran, who is the current scientific program chair of the CCOT. He is an orthopedic surgeon working at the Raffles Center in Singapore. And his naturally, his area of speciality is the foot and ankle. And then the second speaker is uh, Dr. Siu Kwai Ming from Hong Kong. He's working at the Prince Margaret Hospital and the North Lanta Hospital. He's the current president of the Hong Kong Orthopedic Association and also the national delegate to the Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association. And Dr. Mandeep Dillon, uh, who has been a president of uh, so many societies that I would send out an email list of all the names. It's too long, it'll take the whole time. He's the current research chair of Aotrauma Asia Pacific and a renowned foot and ankle surgeon from India and known across the AO globe. So first we will have Dr. Gaudison speaking on his talk, which would, would be on syndesmotic injuries. Over to him. Thank you, Jamal. Um, I'm just going to uh, open up my presentation. Um, can you see it yet, Jamal? Not yet. Not yet, okay. You'll have to share your screen. Yep. Yes, we can see it okay. now. You'll have to. Yes. Okay, is that better? Yes. yes. Okay, lovely. Uh, begin with by uh, uh, thanking uh, the UP Orthopedic Association, Dr. Agrawal, the president. Uh, a personal note of thanks to Jamal for this invitation. Um, my panelists, uh, Kwai Ming and uh, Professor Dillon, uh, it is a, a collective honor and privilege uh, to be able to uh, participate in this event. Uh, I always learn a lot uh, from this kind of interactive sessions. And I think the challenge uh, in the next 15 minutes is really to talk about something that is uh, um, indeed highly controversial, and I would say that a fair amount of equipoise uh, in the community uh, surrounding this event. 
Uh, I have uh, several conflicts, uh, but none of it are directly related to this particular presentation. Um, and uh, I, I started off by, by coining this presentation title as the movers and shakers, but uh, Jamal asked me to try and focus on the syndesmosis, um, which in itself uh, is a, a controversial area. Um, but I can't really move and encapsulate the discussion around the syndesmosis without actually touching uh, on the deltoid. So I will start off on the syndesmosis, but I will mention the deltoid uh, towards the end, and I'll try and do it all within uh, 15 minutes. So this is a, a kind of a flow chart which uh, I put up uh, to try and kind of elaborate and explain uh, how we should all indeed look at any sort of controversial uh, topics or indeed any pathology for the matter. Understanding the pathoanatomy, uh, I think is critical. But then the, the difficult part is really making a sound and reasonable clinical judgment, which is of course evidence-based uh, without any uh, bias. Uh, and finally, of course, as surgeons, we are very inclined to learn about technical execution and ultimately the care has to be focused. Now, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, talk and focus uh, largely on making a good clinical judgment. So the ankle syndesmosis, it is indeed a debate, uh, and the debate rages on. If you asked me to try and focus uh, or home down on the controversies uh, surrounding the ankle syndesmosis, I will say it really comes down to do these two of these questions. Ultimately, do we fix or we don't fix? So it is a question of clinical judgment. Uh, and indeed, next is how to fix it. Now, it is a little bit uh, elaborate and laborious to try and cover both of these in 15 minutes. So I'm going to focus predominantly on the first controversy, which is uh, whether we fix or we don't fix. Now, the issue surrounding the syndesmotic uh, pathology uh, has always been initially one of terminology, but then more really focusing on the recognition of pathology. Syndesmotic injury per se, uh, it is not a, uh, an issue unless and only if it results in instability. And so the recognition that this is a spectrum uh, of injuries that results and begins with injury, but that ends up with instability uh, is important. And so the tricky aspect uh, behind recognizing and therefore treating this pathology is recognizing when injury actually evolves into becoming a pathology. This is an arthroscopic image ankle uh, of someone, myself actually, sticking a probe uh, into the incisura between the tibia and the fibula. And one can again appreciate that whilst this is clearly abnormal, the answer is how much of a give or how much of a leeway uh, is actually then considered to be abnormal. So the questions that we really want to focus on is, we need to recognize that in treating syndesmotic injuries, we want to treat instability and not just injury. So the question is, how do we demonstrate instability uh, based on our clinical assessment and as well as our investigative armamentarium? And indeed, the difficult point is, how and, and what do we consider normal and therefore what is abnormal? So this is a table chart that illustrates uh, really the evolution of various uh, investigative modalities that we've used uh, in our practice, uh, really in the last 10, 20 years, perhaps. The thing I want to say about this slide is we are certainly moving on from the left side of the table towards the right side of the table. And the reason for that is we are recognizing more and more that syndesmotic instability is indeed more of a dynamic phenomenon. And therefore, utilizing static modalities to try and diagnose a dy dynamic phenomenon uh, is indeed very difficult. And also the shortcomings or the negative uh, downsides of using a static modality uh, results in an overcall of, of potential syndesmotic injuries. And so the research, the, the current treatment options, and indeed uh, the, the future will really focus very much on these dynamic tests. This is a compilation of various studies, uh, both RCTs, uh, some systematic reviews, uh, as well as comparative uh, 
observational studies that looked at various options. And you look from that slide, you go on the vertical columns from the left to the right, looking at diagnostic modalities, physical examination findings, x-rays, arthroscopy findings. And really, there is no consistency from one study to the next when trying to differentiate in this spectrum what is injury and what is instability. And so there is a huge degree, or at least there has been a huge degree, uh, of, of a gray zone uh, between how different authors have differentiated when the pathology actually evolves from going from an injury to an instability. And so the question that I want to spend some time talking about is when does an injury lead to instability and therefore what is considered a normal measurement and what is not? So the person who's done a, a lot of research, uh, certainly uh, in, the, in the recent last three to five years is Chris Giovanni. Chris is a, a, a friend, a senior surgeon based at uh, MassGen in Boston. And he has done uh, multiple different cadaveric studies uh, on uh, transactional results of cadaveric ligaments and how they affect uh, ankle uh, syndesmotic instability. And this is really what one of the most cited papers uh, when it comes to demonstrating uh, syndesmotic instability. And in this study, he showed uh, in point number one, varied ligament transactional orders. So these are the syndesmotic individual ligaments correlated with different scope size uh, provocation of instability. Point number two, he did show that in this paper, that once you got to about 3.7 millimeters of a probe size, then you were able to correlate x-ray findings for a give or a gap on the coronal plane with actual arthroscopic instability. Interestingly, on the third point, he also showed in this group that lateral or sagittal motion on fluoroscopy was actually far more sensitive than medial lateral motion. Now, this goes against our historical teaching and indeed our training, where we've always conventionally looked at fluoroscopy images on the AP view, looked at Taylor tilt and Taylor shifts, did the hook test in a coronal plane to try and demonstrate coronal plane instability. But indeed, this was perhaps one of the earliest studies which showed that sagittal plane instability was actually far more sensitive than coronal plane instability. Gino Kirchhoff from Netherlands uh, published in the KSSTA in May of this year. And again, uh, reiterated what Chris Giovanni showed. And indeed, in the sagittal plane, this group showed that the value of 3.4 millimeters or 3 millimeters using an arthroscopic hook was probably a little bit more than what was actually the critical turning point. And in fact, they proposed that 2.9 millimeters in the anterior incisura and 3.4 millimeters in the posterior incisura, and this is the sagittal plane, was about the cutoff point where you would actually go from injury to instability. Mark Dracos from uh, the Hospital of Special Surgery in New York, again, just under two years ago, I did a similar study and showed that lateral imaging with stress uh, provocation was actually a lot more uh, intuitive, a lot more responsive and reliable as far as demonstrating instability than the conventional AP mortis view. This is one of my favorite papers that coins up the uh, current understanding, and this is by Prakash. Uh, in February of 2017, he did a, uh, a systematic review that looked at uh, just under nine uh, selected papers and showed very nicely that there was no consistency from one study to another with regards to what is normal radiological parameters and what it's not. But what he really showed nicely was that every single study that he chose and analyzed showed and consistently demonstrated that comparison with the contralateral limb was probably the best control. In other words, if one was unsure what is normal and what is abnormal, either on a um, dynamic uh, scan like an ultrasound or a weight-bearing CT, or even on a static X-ray with gravity stress or manual stress, then doing the same interventional modality on the, compa on the comparative opposite limb of the same patient was the best comparison of what is normal and what is abnormal for that patient. So then at this point, <clears throat> the question is, how does the deltoid feature uh, into all of this? So this is a, a, 
uh, a great paper by James, James Calder. Uh, I had the fortune of doing a fellowship with him uh, just under 10 years ago. James, James uh, clientele is largely elite athletes. Uh, and James uh, demonstrated in this paper in arthroscopy 2016 in 64 elite athletes with isolated syndesmotic injuries. So these are without fractures that were followed up to about three years. The group that was stable, so your classic grade ones, probably some of the grade twos, uh, were treated with boot and rehabilitation. The unstable ones were then treated with arthroscopy, KIV stabilization, depending on what was found in arthroscopy. But what was interesting from this paper was that point three on that slide, which is that instability was about nine times more common the demonstrated uh, and 11 times more commonly demonstrated in those with a deltoid injury. So if you had a positive squeeze test, you are far more likely to have instability uh, of the syndesmotic complex. And interestingly, if your deltoid was involved, you're 11 times more likely. And this really gave a lot of recognition to the role of the deltoid ligament as part of the syndesmotic stability complex. Um, and I'm going to spend the next sort of five or six minutes talking a little bit about the deltoid. But before I do that, again, this is a paper by Chris Giovanni and group from the Mass Gen. And they showed with transactions of the ligaments in the sagittal plane, looking at fibular translation uh, of the incisura, that the optimum arthroscopic point in terms of provocation in the sagittal plane was about two millimeters. But once that third point is very important in that once you have three ligaments of the syndesmosis ruptured, or when these ligaments are partially ruptured and the deltoid becomes incompetent, then you definitely have sagittal plane instability. In other words, if you have injured the ligaments between your tibia and fibula, so that's your IOL, your PITFL, your AITFL, you're probably still going to be okay as long as your deltoid is intact and you're not going to have instability. But once you have a partial injury of those ligaments, and your deltoid is also incompetent, then you move in that spectrum from an injury onto instability. And so at this point, the, the, the kind of summary I want to give or the, the take home message is that the ankle syndesmotic instability is actually a confluent contribution or, or a joint effort of multiple different ligaments around the ankle. And a combined deficit of any one of these isolated groups ligaments will result uh, in ankle incendiary instability. And the question really is, which one of those are injured in that particular patient? I just want to touch the last five minutes about this deltoid conundrum. Uh, and what is it about the deltoid that's changing uh, in our current practice and how we are looking at the deltoid very differently? So we've all gone through orthopedic training and conventional historical data has shown that fibular malreduction, that's caused altered contact loading pressures. This really go back to uh, what I would describe as fraught studies back in the 70s, where we've shown that alteration if one millimeter changes the contact point pressures of 42% results in arthritis. We've known that that's not true now. And it's actually a combination of different factors. But the point is, we've historically focused a huge amount on bony alignment. And in the bimalleolar equivalent of those injuries, we are thought that we don't need to open the medial side unless we can't reduce the mortise uh, after fibular reduction. And usually if the mortise is perfectly reduced, there's absolutely no need to open the medial side. And there are also studies to collaborate this. Uh, and this is published uh, at the end of the last century uh, to show that there was no need to repair the deltoid if the anatomic reduction of the mortise is fine. And congruency uh, in the under fluoroscopy in the operating room is a critical point. But in my practice, and indeed a lot of my colleagues in our joint uh, uh, study group analysis of this condition, we've all noticed that you start seeing ankle fracture patients coming back months down the line, sometimes between a year, possibly even two, maybe even up to five years to say that they've got pain, a little bit of a valgus sag of the hind foot, difficulty with push off because of pain beneath the submedial malleolus region, and maybe even a degree of weakness. We've all done x-rays, the x-rays look great. We have nothing wrong with the bony alignment and we tend to tell them that, well, you've got an ankle fracture 
you've had to live with some degree of pain forever, or maybe even we'll take the metal work out and hopefully this will get better. Uh, and it doesn't. Uh, for those of us who have been a bit more prudent, we may even do a uh, metal suppression MRI scan and say that, look, there's no intraarticular pathology or there is no chondral lesions. Uh, there's nothing to account for your pain. But in reality, uh, if we go back to the literature, this is a great study from Mickelson in 96, over 20 years ago, questioning the role of the deltoid. And for those of, for those of us who do uh, uh, foot and ankle reconstructive surgery with osteotomies, we've always recognized and acknowledged the fact that a complete fibrillar osteotomy does not actually alter the ankle biomechanics and kinematics uh, as long as the medial side is intact. And if you have a medial side that is intact, that's proven both clinically as well as radiologically, then fibula osteotomy doesn't actually change uh, the ankle kinematics. And Mickelson went off to really nicely encapsulate that and describe that in words. And he showed that lateral fractures associated with major injuries to deltoid ligament should actually rightfully be treated with a lateral fixation, but don't ignore the medial side and treat that adequately with immobilization to allow for the deltoid ligament to heal at its resting length. But then what's changed in the last 25 years? I'll be very careful when I say this because we have the chairman of the research AO group here in our, in our, in our company. And the thing that's changed is AO philosophy. Now, AO has taught us so many things about fracture fixation, rehab, and outcome result. But one of the things that AO has also done aggressively, as far as fractures are concerned, is to promote early motion and early weight bearing. Now, we all recognize as surgeons that that's absolutely critical. Muscle, ligament, even cartilage, uh, survivorship, and quality improves with weight bearing and early loading. The, ten the tendon strength does increase and therefore early range of motion and weight bearing is important. The problem is the various other treatment protocols and guidelines that recognize and treat the other pathologies which happen alongside the fracture hasn't quite caught up. And let me explain what I mean. As I've done a lot more ankle uh, arthroscopy assisted fracture fixations in the last five years, I've noticed a lot more deltoid and syndesmotic injuries, much more than I would have picked up on a weight bearing CT, on a clinical examination, on an x-ray, and maybe even an MRI scan. There's much better identification, there's a higher sensitivity rate with arthroscopy, uh, and deltoid injuries are a lot more common when you see when you're looking at high energy transfer injuries, so Weber C, Weber, Weber B fractures. And indeed, Hinterman showed this very nicely in his paper uh, in the British Journal in 2000. So in reflecting back, what's actually happened is we've changed our bony, if you like, or AO treatment regimes to actually start early range of motion and early weight bearing, but we haven't actually changed the way in which we manage the pathology during the operation. So our intraoperative paradigm hasn't actually changed. So if we want to get patients or our athletes or our high demand patients back onto early action or early play, then we really have to address both issues. That is the bone as well as the soft tissue. So if you're looking at another joint, for example, for the traumas, for all the trauma surgeons in the group and those who are watching, if you're treating an elbow fracture, with an associated ulnar collateral ligament. There is no way we're going to fix the bones and ignore the ulnar collateral ligament because we recognize and we acknowledge that that is a significant contributor of the stability of the joint after. And so fixing the bones without actually addressing the ligaments at the same time will almost ultimately result in some degree of failure. And so in the ankle with athletes and high demand, uh, high demand patients, if we are going to treat the deltoid ligament injury non-operatively, having recognized that there is one, then we have to acknowledge that this requires a prolonged period of immobilization. And if we are also going to continue to treat them non-operatively, we need to start rehab after the initial six to eight weeks of immobilization. But if we're not going to do that, and we want to go by the AO philosophy and get them moving early and weight bearing, then we have to treat both bones as well as the soft tissues. And I'll end there. But before that, I'll summarize what I've been trying to say in the last 15 minutes. Coming back to the syndesmosis, 
it is important to recognize that it is a spectrum. It's a continuum that ranges from ankle syndesmotic injuries all the way up to instability. The critical point of transformation from injuries to instability is where we want to intervene with treatment. Dynamic assessments will help us a lot and indeed the future will be governed and advocated a lot more by dynamic assessments rather than historical, more conventional static assessments. And we need to acknowledge that this is a three-dimensional phenomenon with instability occurring in multiple planes, both in the coronal plane, the sagittal plane, the axial plane, and the rotational plane. It is unclear how much of a medial lateral graph truly signifies instability but it's likely in the range of about three millimeters. And we are, if we're doing an arthroscopy to try and demonstrate this, then it's been shown nicely that a three millimeter probe will quite nicely demonstrate this transformation from a true normal give to an actual unstable ankle in the coronal plane. In the lateral plane, however, the sagittal plane, if you're doing a fluoroscopy and trying to provocate instability, a translation or a, trans a movement of about two millimeters is probably the critical turning point. The other point to take home is that the comparison with the opposite extremity is probably the single best reference for any patient to as to what is normal. If especially if we're dealing with someone who's had a previous injury or who has multiple ligament laxity, or for some reason or the other, it's difficult to try and decide what is normal and what it's not, then scan the opposite side or stress the opposite side to get what is a normal reference. And finally, and this has been really nicely shown again by Chris Giovanni's team, that the syndesmotic complex is very similar to a pelvic ring. So there are trauma surgeons in the group. We've always known and treated and taught uh, our, our trainees and students that the pelvic ring does not actually give at just one point. There is bound to be an insufficiency or a gap on a contralateral side. And the ankle syndesmosis is very, very similar. You have the lateral ligament complex beneath the fibula, you have the deltoid on the medial side, and you have the ligaments between the tibia and the fibula. And if one of those ligaments give way or are ruptured, but the other two are grossly intact, then the ankle congruency and mortis can still be prevailed. But if you have a give on more than one with a partial injury or complete injury, then it's very likely that this ring is going to be compromised. And in that situation, it's better to get on and fix it. Uh, and I will end there. Thank you, Jamal. Thanks a lot, Jao. So, Dr. Sanjay Devan has the questions. Hello? Can you hear me, guys? I can hear you, Jamal. Yes. I don't have a question I don't know. This one X-ray, they want to show it and just put it here. So you go, go, go ahead. Your voice, voice is not clear. The voice is not clear. Having voice? Am I clear now? Hello? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. I, yeah, I know, but the guy who has the question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Dhiran is there. Anyway, do you have experience of fixing these syndesmotic injuries with the with the bioabsorbable sutures or the suture anchors? Yeah. So it's a great question, Jama. Uh, so that's really the second question which I touched on, which, which I didn't elaborate on, which is how does one fix this? Um, so first and foremost, I would say there's really no conclusive evidence in the literature uh, about uh, whether one device is better than the other. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about the uh, suture button uh, or the tightrope device by Arthrex being more physiological. But in reality, there's no evidence to say that it's actually better uh, than conventional screw fixation. Um, so in my practice, uh, I, I've gone from using the tightrope back to screws. But what I do do, though, is um, I put my screws through a small plate, especially the ones that are purely syndesmotic, so there's no associated fractures. 
The rationale for using the plate is you have better compression of the fibula onto the tibial incisura, as opposed to just using a screw. Uh, I put, I always put two screws rather than one screw, and I try to diverge the screws rather than make them parallel, uh, which is what the AO conventional teaching has been. The rationale for that is you obviously have better pull-out strength uh, if the devices are divergent. So if I used a tight rope as well, I would make them divergent uh, to ensure that you get best pull-out strength and you have best catch. Uh, there is a nice paper in JBJS that tells us about the angles that we should go through. But bottom line is, there's no evidence that one is better than the other. And I don't think it makes a huge difference in terms of stability. But I think the technical execution is important. And I'd go with a small plate, two screws, divergent. Uh, doesn't matter if it's tricortical or, or quadricortical. I don't think it makes a difference. May I make a comment here? Sure, sir. Uh, I, I agree with what Gao is saying. But the two things which I would like to highlight, especially in a scenario where there's a fracture involved, with this mosaic. Yes, you want it right there, but we really don't want too much compression. What we aim is for stability with the aim of... Yes. And so the alternative to that, which I think is a, a very good, very reasonable way, is just to make a small incision over the anterolateral aspect of the fibula uh, at the site at which the reduction is going to be done and actually visualize uh, the anterior complex of the of the syndesmosis. It's very difficult to actually look at the back of it because the back of it is actually blocked off by the perineal artery and also the perineal muscle group. So you can't see the PITFL and the posterior complex, but you can definitely visualize the anterior complex. So trying to ensure and being very sure that the fibula is sitting in the incisura before actually putting those screws in, uh, I think is very important. I completely echo uh, Prof's uh, comment uh, about the use of the, uh, of the clamp and the position of the foot. Now, I don't use a clamp. And the reason, like Prof said as well, is we don't want compression. We just want position and we want to hold it in that position, even with our finger, just hold it in the right position and then pass the screws in. And the position of the foot as well, uh, I keep it in neutral. Now, the question about divergence or convergence. So, the ra my rationale is that in the coronal plane, or if you like, in the medial lateral plane, if you have two screws that are completely parallel, then theoretically the pullout strength is going to be lower. And so if the screws are slightly divergent in the AP plane, then there's less likelihood of that happening. Now, in the, in the sagittal plane, or if, if you like, in the axial plane, uh, there's good evidence that you want to actually put the screws in a, in a, in a passion that tries to mimic the limbs of the syndesmosis. So one is, as you say rightly, so it's about 30 degrees the anterior plane of the direct medial tibia fibula uh, axis, and one that is 30 degrees posterior. You don't want to go too far behind because you're going to skirt off the back of the uh, tibia, obviously, but the angulation in the axial plane is very much like what we've always done with the AO screws, but it's just on the AP plane that I make it a little bit divergent because of compression and, and strength of fixation. Over to you, Prof. Thanks, Gao. Gao, I'm going to be showing a case in my talk, which is not actually a syndesmotic case, but I'm going to be talking about this, exactly what you're talking about. I agree with almost everything you've said, but I like to take it further one little bit because people go away being the confusion with, should it be two cortices, one cortex, three cortices. Now you don't have to think about the syndesmosis as an alone injury. You've got to look at the fibular fracture. You've got to look at the deltoid, which is very, very important. And I reiterate what Gao said. The medial side of the complex is very, very important. And I've got a figure which shows you what I'm talking about. At the end of my talk, this will become clear. So if you've got a good fibular fixation, if you've got a good posterior malleolus fixation, if you've got a good medial malleolus fixation, then the syndesmosis becomes not very, very unstable. It's just a little unstable. So you can get away with only one screw. And the direction why people used to do put it at 30 degrees is because the fibula is at an angle of 30 degrees posteriorly to it. And the original concept came that if you put a direct lateral to medial screw and you tighten it, it will tend to push the fibula backwards, which happens in so many times that I've got a case to show that happens. So that's why they say put it at 30 degrees. So even if you over tighten it by mistake, you're not going to push the fibula out of the incisura. And 
if you're only stabilizing the syndesmosis, then you want all these multiple areas of stability. If you've done a fibula, if you've done a posterior malleolus, if you've done the medial malleolus or a delta repair, then even one screw is more than enough to hold it. And the aim of the screw is, it's only to hold it till the ligaments heal. That is the key concept which everyone has to understand. Final question to all the three. If you do, I mean, if you see international literature, there's more or less agreement that there is uh, similar complications, similar outcomes with screws and tight ropes. But in the majority of studies, they seem to say that there is a faster return to work with tight rope. Do you all agree with that or not? Your question is incomplete. <laughs> the question is incomplete because if it is, is an isolated <laughs> ligamentous injury of the syndesmosis, it's a different thing. If it is a trimalleolar fracture, it is a different thing. So in an isolated injury, perhaps tight rope would allow us to return to sports faster. But if you've got a trimalleolar complex and if you have to stabilize everything individually, then maybe a screw is better because people forget that the talus and the foot are hanging from the distal part of the fibula. The tibia has gone away. The distal fibula is still attached to the talus and the foot and it's hanging. So we may have to counteract all these forces, which we do with the fibular plate, medial malleolus fixation. And if you are doing it also by syndesmotic screws, then screws are better in the uh, for that kind of a scenario. Thank you, sir. Uh, may we now proceed to the second talk. This is by my dear friend, Dr. Ming from Hong Kong, and he'll be speaking on the management of posterior malleolar fractures. Dr. Ming. Okay, um, my talk is on the management of posterior malleolar fractures. I will discuss about the following. First of all, I would like to present a case. A 23 year old lady fell from stairs, complained of white ankle fracture. In this x ray, how many fractures can you see? Triangular fracture. <laughs> the fracture of the top of the distal fibula and the middle malleolus. Any more fracture here? Yes, the um, fetch of the posel malleolus. Okay. And uh, in fact, for fetch of the posel malleolus, the CT scan can demonstrate uh, much better than the X ray about this fracture, the characteristic, the size, and the displacement. So for this case, operation was performed. For AO type B and C angle fractures, it's up to 46% are associated with posterior malleolar fracture. This fracture is considered as a bony avulsion of the posterior tibial fibular ligament and associated with poor outcome. And CT scan is regarded as the gold standard to assess the posterior malleolar fracture. And, uh, and CT scan is indicated in all the complex angle fractures. For the, in case, for the indication, is it the one fourth or one third of the typical platform involvement should fix the fracture? It's not the size, but the accuracy of reduction affects outcome, even containing 10% of the joint articular surface. Here, so the types of the posterior malar fracture by Barton track. For type one, in, in just the is a kind of extra in situ rough type of fracture. Type two, involve the postal lateral aspect. Type three, the postal middle two part fracture. And the type four, is the very large postal lateral triangular fracture. So for a treatment for type one, non operative treatment is usually um, choose. For type two, usually for operative treatment, while for type four, Three and type four operation is usually required. 
So for the indication for fixation of a pulsar molar fracture, it, if it, there's a significant in situ involvement, the impression of the typical platform and displacement of the fracture. Here, so the circle of poses. For the posterolateral approach, is for type two to type four fractures to fix the posterolateral fragment here and the fibular fracture on the lateral side. For the posterometer approach, is for type three fracture to fix the posterometer fragment as well as the middle malaria fracture. What the advantage of fixation of posterior malaria fracture? Because it can provide an anatomic reduction, the fixation of the arterial surface, and stabilization of the syntesmosis and restoration of the length of the fibula. For a cerebral technique, in fact, the direct reduction and fixation from posterior side is preferred than the indirect reduction because it can give a more accurate and stable fixation. How about the impacted also control fragments is, is large enough, you can fix it if it's too small or commuted, you can remove this. In fact, for the posamara fragment, usually provisionally fixed with multiple KY or guide pins. For the choice implant, we can use school, partial feather school as next school. If that is, is bone loss, we can use full feather school. For a larger fragment or those bone with uh, also pin near, buttress plate is usually indicated. In fact, you can also insert the screw to it, this to the fracture site to provide additional rotational stability. How about the intro assessment of the reduction? Through the posterolateral and posterometer approach, you can have direct visualization of the reduction. Um, However, there are other means, for example, use the transfibular approach. We can assess the poster model fracture reduction through the fracture site at the fibula. If we external rotate the distal fibula fragment here, and we use the first fluoroscopy, if we have intra CT, we one of the means, and also angle force we, is also a useful, useful means to assess reduction. Here, so a 53-year-old lady fell from stairs. We started in white trimolar fracture. Here, so the uh, X-ray injury film, and the CT scan review a impacted fragment at the typical platform. Okay, is a type three posterior molar fracture. Bottom of check. Okay, how to fix this? What are the circle post position the patient had leak? Also, the implant use. So we can use the uh, posterolateral pose to fix the fibular fracture as well as the posterolateral fragment here. For the posterometer approach, we reduce the osteochondral fragment and reduce the posterometer fragment of the posteromolarus as well as the posteromedial or uh, the medial molarus fracture. Okay, you notice the subconscious school to fix the osteochondral fragment. Here's so the uh, in of photo. The patient will operate in prone position. This show the posteromedial approach. In fact, the impacted osteochondral fragment was reduced and provisionally fixed with a two guide pin here. In fact, you can appreciate there's a uh, anatomical reduction of the articular surface. And therefore, by insertion of clinical school, here's all the result. So at post of six years, the patient had only felt mild pain occasionally, and uh, at the expert at post of three years, there's no significant OA changes. The next case is six, 67 year old lady, spring white ankle while catching a bus, resulting in a malaria fracture. And then the CT scan uh, saw the fracture clearly with a very large triangular fragment, poster molonus, a bottom track type 4 fracture. How to fix this? 
So both postal middle and postal lateral approaches were used. This show the postal middle approach. We can appreciate the large, the postal modular fragment here. And we fix this fragment for the postal middle approach as well to fix the middle modulus. So for the postal letter post, we fix the fibula and also use a buttress plate to fix the uh, postal modulus in addition to a net screw here. On the middle side, we fix the fracture middle modulus with a kind of screw and plate. Here so the early postal X-ray a satisfactory reduction and post of one year, the picture united, and the, the picture only has a minimal discomfort and a good rate of motion and T photo for up. Another case, a um, case with complication, a 51 year old lady fell from a few steps of stairs, compared to left angle pain. Here, so the bottom check, type three. Pulsar molar fracture here, two parts in, involving the pulsar middle side, and also fracture of the distal fibula. So uh, the, um, this patient will operate with other doctors through the pulsar lateral approach in prone position. However, in the pulsar x ray, it's so wide in the middle care space, and they refer to me. And CT scan reveal a widening of the syntesmosis. And, and there's a non screw impinging to the tibia and my reduction of the pulsar. What to do? I revise the uh, fixation or RF find it initial the, the original pulsar lateral approach with anchor forcibly in supply position. Here, so the intra photo. This so the postal lateral fragment of the postal molonus fracture here. The FHL, FHL will be treated medially, prolong the muscle naturally, and reduce it. So, the an angle forcibly a loose bony fragment was noted, and I removed this bony fragment. And the pulsar modulus was reduced and used two buttress plate here and reduced the syndesmosis and put in two centimeter screw. Here, so the early pulsar result on um, a satisfactory alignment reduction and at two years, the patient was unaided and no angle pain and also low pain. The last case is a 63-year-old man who and fell while walking stairs. Compared to painful uh, left lower leg, in fact, they fracture the distal uh, tibia with a depressed articular fragment of about four millimeter. And also spinal fracture of the uh, tibial shot and fracture of the proximal fibula and distal fibula. So this um, because the most of the fracture is in the uh, posterior side, I also operated the patient in prone position. Use the posterior lateral pose to the distal fibula and tibia, and the posterior middle pose for the use of plate, and do the angle of forcibly. In fact, uh, this looking backwards posteriorly, you see, see a step at the articular surface after reduction. There's an internal reduction of the both uh, impeded fragment as well as the pulsar modulus. Okay, the impeded fragment is here. So um, here's so the uh, pulse of X-ray at four years, more than aided, also for a mild degree of discomfort and a, a good rate of motion. Here, so the X-ray at four years without any uh, significant OA changes. To summarize, I think the indication of fixation of the pulsar modulus include the involvement of the in situ, impact on the typical platform, displacement of the fracture, and also an atomic reduction and stable fixation of the fracture is important to reconstruct the fibula notch, typical platform, and the 
integrity of the posterior tibial fibula ligament from the stability of the synthesis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So, now we uh, can we proceed with the uh, question, Dr. Sanjay Dhawan? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have any particular questions from the audience right now. I do. Uh, you, uh, you go ahead. You know, we've we've always. First of all, uh, my statement is I'm not a foot and ankle surgeon, right? But we've often been taking the 25% rule as the cutoff where we want to fix, where we don't want to fix. In today's scenario and the evidence-based medicine, does it actually hold true? I think for the 25%, the rule is that as a maybe do the decrease on the contact area of the articular surface, okay, including the joint pressure. There's a usual adopted um, criteria in the past, but uh, with the more uh, paper and study, we think that even less than 25%, so even some people said that even 10% is important to fix the posterior In some cases, restore the uh, synthesmotic stability and also um, to to aim at to uh, reduce the fibula in a, a proper length. Yeah. Uh, there's one question. No, before yes. that, Dr. Dillon wants yes. to make a comment. Dr. Dhawan, Dr. Dillon wants to make a comment. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that the 25% rule came up when we only used radiology x-rays to make the diagnosis. That is one. And number two, there are studies now which show that if the foot is in a slightly different angle, all that 25% can become 10% in one view and 40% in the other. Ever since the CT is came in, and I'm going to show you a case of mine in my talk, which went wrong because of this 25% rule. The CT has shown us that it is not the size which is important. Ask any baby. Size doesn't matter. It is the stability. It is the stability which we can impart. And the more and more we have understood the ankles being a multiple a kind of a segmental instability fracture, more we realize the importance of fixing the posterior malleolus. So I agree with the speakers here that it's like the pelvis. You can't just fix maybe the anterior pelvis or fix the sacro-like joint and leave the rest of the ring intact. It'll go on moving. So it's a call you have to take. It's not the size. It's the degree of initial displacement of the talus compared to the talus. And my case, which went wrong, will actually clarify some things when we. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dillon. There's a question from audience, Dr. Anpam Srivastam from Varanasi. He wants to know that in trimalular fracture, which one should be fixed first? How do you decide that? Um, okay. In fact, um, it uh, depends on many factors. In fact, uh, usually uh, the fibula is uh, less convoluted, it more just a uh, one feather line. Usually, we fix the uh, uh, less convoluted first, usually on the fibula side. Okay. And uh, then uh, followed by the, um, say, the uh, poster monitors or the middle monitors. Is the usual um, practice okay? Can I take this? Some oh. yeah. Some like time. Time. Question. In a both bore forearm, radius and arena, which one should you play it first? The question itself is slightly inadequately phrased. You should be able to reduce all fractures before you start fixing them. So the first thing is to get the length right, you have to temporarily stabilize and reduce the fibula and then go on to the posterior malleolus. If you put a plate on the fibula on the lateral surface, you will never be able to radiologically assess the distal part of the posterior malleolus, whether it's reduced well or not. So you, you reduce all your fractures, even if you temporarily stabilize them, multiple k wires, etc., then you can fix all of them. If you're working on the lateral side, we, in my, my practice, I hold the fibula up to length temporarily, then stabilize the posterior malleolus with screw 
then plate the fibula and then go and see the medial side which is often the neglected one sometimes intraoperatively you have to ensure that the talus is sitting correctly i have a case which tells you how we serially fix it in the in my talk subsequently but you do not want to see this again so you reduce them all and the sequence of fixation depends uh, you know it really doesn't matter but yes it would be better if you could get the fibula out to length but if you put a plate then lateral radiograph will not show you accuracy of posterior malleolus reduction so get the fibula out to length put in your screws for the posterior malleolus then you can plate both the structures from the posterior lateral side then go to the medial side so reduction is important not sequence of fixation Jamal, I just want to add on to what uh, Professor Dylan has said and made some some key points. So I think that that uh, that algorithm that we can manage all trimalleolar fractures with a fixed sequence of events uh, is a bit like saying we can manage all pilon fractures with a set fixed sequence of events, um, and that's not true. So I think uh, just like Prof has said. Uh, it would appear that the, generally the, the simpler method would be to get the fibula out to length and correct rotation, and usually that gets it out to speed. The only thing I want to add to that is sometimes I found that fixing the posterior malleolus uh, through a postal lateral approach uh, is sometimes easier to fix the postal medial side first than fix the postal lateral fragment. So this. Uh, uh, the Haraguchi classification has got two uh, types of the subtype to the classification of grade two. You've got a 2A and a 2B, uh, which is a postural lateral fragment and a postural medial fragment. So I have found it in, in instances where one fixes the fibula and then fixes the postural lateral fragment. But then when you take an AP view after that, you find that there's a double shadow on the medial side. And that's because the lateral, the postural lateral fragment pushes the postural medial fragment. And in those situations, I sometimes go and fix the medial side first, buttress the postural medial column. So even if it's a vertical shear or a supination reduction with a long plate, and then come back and fix the postural lateral side. The other comment I want to make, Jamal, is that uh, I never ever, I've stopped fixing for the longest time, fixing these posterior malleolus from front to back. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Always fix it from back to front, uh, from the uh, unstable fragment to the, to the stable fragment. There's, there are lots of evidence to show that that pushes the fragment out. Uh, I get CT scans for all my posterior malleolar fractures because I think you just cannot see on an X-ray. Uh, and your point about the uh, percentages and size of fragment, we, you know, and I'm sure Prof will show later on, there's so many variants where the size of the fragment varies so much depending on your angle of the fluoroscopy. Uh, and so I think everyone should get a CT because you have rim fractures, you have large PM and PL fragments. And I think CT uh, is got to be the way forward with, with posterior fractures. So, so probably, the, probably the faculty's take home message would be that a mo more posterior malleolar fractures actually require fixation then people actually end up fixing yes yes and the concept of postural uh, postural malleolar fractures being stable and undisplaced is more a fictional fragment of imagination than actually exists and anterior to posterior fixation is only giving your mental fixation but not the bone fixation would that be it yes okay. very well summarized <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Now we proceed to the third talk that is by Professor Dr. Mandeep Dillon. And, uh, sir, yes. go over to you. Thank you, sir. I have shared my screen. You, you, have, guys... to, you have to put it on uh, presentation. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Like, sure. Yeah. you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to take my talk a little further from what we've had. I really love both these talks because they clarified the principles and they made so much of my work easier. But I'm going to be talking about the challenges I have personally faced in treating the complex ankle fractures. So those are my disclosures. Unfortunately, nobody pays me, which is sad, but that's the truth. But 
let's come to the outcome of what i'm talking about there's a fact that we all need to know that despite operative treatment and this was a study published 20 years ago 30% of ankle fractures would develop some degree of arthrosis now this is something i want you to look at think about while i go on with my talk so there is something which we are possibly doing wrong and during my talk we'll try to understand what is it that we possibly are doing wrong remember two things anything in life there are some things which are not in our control there are some things which are in our control that is the basic fundamental of life which also applies to ankle fractures now if you look at things which are not in our control is how much is the chondral or articular damage what is the fracture pattern pattern or the comorbidity which the patient comes to you with that is nothing you can control you have to deal with it as it is there but there are some things which are in our control like for example our understanding of the injury how accurately we reduce the joint get the fibula rotation length etc and how stable we make our fixation this is something which is totally in our control and let me also tell you that there are so many of us who have now understood that the ankle fracture is not so simple and it should not be delegated to a resident on call to do because they mess it up more often than not so i'm going to talk about all the three patterns of the fractures the weber a the weber b and the weber c and what makes each one of these individual fractures complex let's start with the supination adduction injury it's a simple twist which turns the talus medially pushes the medial malleolus off and pulls off the distal fibula that's what it does it pulls off the distal fibula so the fibular fracture is below the syndesmosis and is considered weber a and therefore relatively easy to operate not such a complex injury unfortunately here we can forget the fibula fracture because the complexity is on the medial side and what do i mean by this complexity on the medial side you have a vertical shear fracture and a significant marginal impaction not in all cases but in many cases which would be a problem if we don't look at it now i'm going to talk about a case this is a 22 year male he fell out in college and while landing he had this injury and somebody said oh it's not such a tough case it's a relatively undisplaced weber a type of fracture put him in a slab and he came to us with a swelling etc but if you look at this x ray and those of you who can understand this x ray would realize the medial complexity we went in and got a ct done look at the depression in the superior medial cord and you can also see the gap and the depression with that large medial malleolus fragment so this is not a simple fracture and this needs accurate reduction remember it's a weber a so there's nothing wrong with the syndesmosis on the lateral side as you can see on the uh, on the ct scan also so this guy was taken up for surgery the medial malleolus was hinged to the side and there you can see that depressed fragment just above the talus you see and then you try we try to open this up push back the articular surface and then graft it you take the graft from the proximal tibia or the lie crest doesn't matter but make sure you have enough graft to put it over there and hold that depressed fragment down and that you can see the joint has been reconstructed the distal tibia now follows the talus so you've got enough graft over there and then we put in what we call as a raft screw you put it in the proximal tibia you put it everywhere you can put it here also so you got this screw it's not long it's divergent screw so it looks as if it's going into the fibula it isn't so you put these screws which act as a raft screw and these fractures heal well so here in a simple weber a fracture the complexity is on the medial side so i'm going to show you another similar injury again weber a supination adduction medial complexity remember this fibula looks good but the medial complexity which can be seen on the ct scan and understood like i showed you just in the previous case so again here we went in in the medial side now if you got a supination adduction 
take your medial incision slightly anterior. You want to see the superior medial corner of the ankle. So when you open it up, you reduce it, graft it, and here the oblique screw is acting like a raft screw. And to counteract the shear forces, which would displace this when we mobilize it early, you have a buttress plate. So all the AO principles are used here, elevation and grafting, raft screw and a buttress plate. And this guy did very well over a period of time. And as you see, even the medial uh, on the lateral side, the fracture is uniting fairly well. Healed well. And remember in Weber A fracture, the complexity is on the medial side. So you've got to have your screws perpendicular to the fracture plane. You have to graft the defects, you have to add buttressing, and you have to have graft screws. So Weber A's complexity is on the medial side. Weber B, now these are the middle zone fractures. You have a partial injury because of the oblique fracture of the syndesmosis. And many people say, especially the CrossFat study which came out of Australia, that if you have no tailor shift, that means there is minimum medial injury, you can treat them without surgery. So that's a school of thought which says, but remember, you have to look at the medial aspect very, very carefully. So when you look at the Weber B fractures, see the tailor shift, see the medial swelling, see the medial tenderness. All of this suggests medial instability. So this particular case, you have to think about repairing the delta ligament. That's exactly what Gao was talking about. Conventionally, the deltoid was thought not necessary to be operated. But we are realizing more and more that in some cases, you fix the deltoid, it would add to the stability of the syndesmosis. And some people say that if you fix the fibula and the deltoid, you can get away without fixing the syndesmosis. But I say it supplements the stability because it holds the tailors firmly fixed to the medial side. That's the key point. I'm going to show you an example. This is a Weber B injury, a supination external rotation injury. You see this big gap over here, although the fracture on the fibula seems to be okay. But I do not believe the X-ray that we conventionally almost always go in for CT scans. And see here, you have a small fragment on the posterior side, which is adding to the instability. Can you see that fragment? So we did stress instability. And I do agree that you have to do it in multiple planes. But here in the AP plane also, it was so very obvious that the talus and the distal fibula were moving as one unit to the lateral side. So this is medially unstable. This is also posteriorly unstable. So in this particular case, we went in through a posterior lateral approach. We stabilized the posterior malleolus. We stabilized the lateral malleolus and then did a stress test. Again, the syndesmosis and the medial side were opening up. You can notice over here that there is some degree of incongruity of the ankle joint. So the next step, we went in and fixed the syndesmosis. We thought we would reconstruct the ring by fixing the syndesmotor. But despite that, there was a shift of the medial side, which was not equal to the other side. So the deltoid ligament here was contributing to this instability. So what we did was we went in and you can see this deltoid ligament here. It is completely torn. And you can see the edges of the deltoid ligament at the distal part. And when you close it, it would really add to the stability. So this case was reconstructed. The proximal part of the deltoid attachment was sort of freshened. And we put in a suture anchor over there. So once the suture anchor is there and see the fiber tape with which I was planning to reinforce the deltoid ligament. So you tie the suture anchors, you get your deltoid stability over here. And then subsequently, you can use the fiber tape to put this, uh, uh, to reinforce it by additional use of the fiber tape down there. Okay, sorry. And after deltoid ligament reconstruction, the whole ankle joint is stable, allows good early movement. 
So the take home message for Weber B fractures, recognize deltoid instability. And this medial stability is essential to reconstitute the ankle ring. And if medial stability cannot be indirectly achieved, note on this, you can often achieve medial stability indirectly by lateral stabilization, by syndesmotic fixation. But if you cannot, don't hesitate to repair the deltoid. What about the pronation abduction injuries? Here, the foot is pronated, the talus pulls off the medial structures, pushes off the fibula. So here you have a complex injury with which where the syndesmosis is definitely disrupted and there's a great chance that there's going to be a large posterior fragment also. So this is the most unstable injury of the ankle you can get. As I said, the fibula and the talus are one unit and the foot is hanging from this. So if you don't reconstruct it properly, you have all the weight of the foot tending to disrupt these minor small operations if you do. So this is a Weber C fracture. Here the complexity is in the fibular fracture and in the syndesmosis. But I won't talk about the ligamentous syndesmotic injuries, but I'm going to bring out a point here that often the syndesmotic injury may be bone. And this is what I'm going to show in the case which is here. This is a Weber C fracture. You can see that the whole talus is tilted the medial malleolus is pushed. It's right in the center of the ankle joint. The syndesmosis is grossly disrupted. And when you do a fixation like this, it seems okay. But this patient was operated outside where an anterior fibular plate was done. The medial malleolus was very well fixed. A syndesmotic screw was also put and it was judged to be okay. But it comes to us within a few couple of weeks with pain loss of ankle dorsiflexion, and the fibula did not seem to be in the right position. And all of this was taken into consideration only with the x-rays. So what did we do? We saw, did a CT scan. And see the importance of the CT scan. You can see that the syndesmosis is not in the right place. And there is actually a large fragment over here, which has displaced from here to here, and the ankle is unstable. And even the screw is actually pushing it back outside. The screw is almost outside. And they probably tightened it. And they tended to push the fibula even more posteriorly in this case. So this case was reoperated. The same incision was used to expose the fibula. Where the plate was taken out, the fracture was freshened, the syndesmotic screw was taken out. And then a second anterior incision was made. And this is the place where you can actually gauge the syndesmotic reduction. So here, the syndesmosis were repositioned. The accuracy was checked. The chaput fragment was fixed with a screw. And we have an intraoperative CT available. The Siemens uh, C arm, which we have, allows them to check the syndesmotic uh, reduction with the CT, which is there intraoperatively. And we found that this was accurately reduced. And these this is the post-op x-ray with the fixed chaput fragment. This was just done a few months ago. And then we asked him to send us a picture during the lockdown. And this is him in his market about 200 kilometers away, showing us that he's doing well, but he can't come and visit us in the hospital. What about the posterior malleolus? I'm not going to talk about posterior malleolus fractures, but I'm going to be talking about something called as transitional fractures which make the posterior malleolus complex injury more complex. Now, I'm going to talk about a case of mine. This was done many years ago before I knew anything about ankle instabilities. This lady came with a history of twist, low energy trauma, and this is what you can see. You can see, obviously, on the lateral view, there is a posterior malleolus fracture. You can see the tailor shift. You can see the fibular shift. And this is exactly what people were talking about about sagittal plane instability, not coronal plane instability of the syndesmosis. So we did an immediate close reduction. It was very easy to do the close reduction. And because it was easy, we did not realize the degree of instability which was there in that anchor. We waited a few days and we fixed it. And I did my standard hook test. This was early 2000 or something, sir, about 15, 20 years ago. We did our angle with the standard screw uh, that hook tests and the syndesmosis seems to be stable 
and the posterior malleolus was not fixed because at that time our understanding was size matters it was considered to be less than 25% and notice in all of this till this period we have not done a ct scan all of this was done because we thought we were great clinicians and it was all very well medial side there was comminution so multiple wires and a screw were put in there and this patient was doing well till she had a stumble 9 months later he presented with anterior medial pain which was there on weight bearing there was restricted dorsiflexion and a painful limp so we now think that something is happening here here is this so called double density sign which is coming up and the posterior malleolus doesn't seem to have united and the talus may not be in its right, right position so at this stage a ct scan was done and lo and behold you see that everything is not in its right position there is tibial impaction medial malleolus is not united posterior malleolus is lying separately and the syndesmosis is, is so called uh, not properly reduced so if you look at it now you now know it's a disrupted platform which was an ankle fracture in the first place so now what happened next month the implants broke pain worsened and so we took her up for surgery with a plan for seeing if we could fix it or we'd have to fuse it and intraoperatively both the talus and the plafon shows degeneration so we had to fix it with an ankle arthrodesis and this is a post ankle fusion exercise but this was a challenging decision what went wrong it was a limited understanding of the fracture there were inadequate investigations and inadequate fixation so now we understand that ankle fractures which involve a vertical force associated with this the tibia the talus is often driven into the posterior plafon and more often it is posterior medial as gao said that the medial fragment may be a little bit bigger sometimes than the lateral fragment and so the pattern here may be per or ser but whatever it is you have to understand these fractures this is what gao was talking about consider the ankle similar to the pelvis when you have the so called tri malleolar fracture you have disruption of the pelvis ring in multiple areas and you have to reconstitute the whole ring not partially hold the ring because the other side with something on which the foot is hanging from remember the foot is hanging through the talus only from the fibula so you have to reconstitute the whole ring for it to become stable so these are what people have talked about the 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 posterior talus shift and the double medial contour which make these so called fractures very very unstable so the take home message from these cases is do a ct scan in complex injury if you can't do a ct scan refer the patient to somewhere where you can get a ct scan and stabilize the whole ring not part of the ring otherwise you will get into trouble but oh before i go is that all well we have some other complex scenario especially the elderly who could have a osteoporotic ankle fracture and these cases have many many problems the fracture pattern may look normal we may treat them as normal but we must fix all the displaced parts however we have to make the construct biomechanically stronger than in a normal non osteoporotic patient so what you need to do is you always need to stabilize the medial sides with an anti guide plate with bone graft with raft screws and for the fibular fractures which could be osteoporotic one of the techniques is you put your screws right across into the fibula so into the tibia which is known as the fibula pro tibia technique to get a better grip of these fractures so gentlemen and if there's a lady lady also not all ankle fractures are straight forward you must recognize the more complex injuries we must apply sound fixation principles we must recognize the high risk ankle and also the high risk patient because here you have to do things slightly differently the fibular length rotation syndesmotic stability are all very very critical but remember do not neglect the medial side our aim is to restore the trimalleolar anatomy 
make the whole complex stable. And once you've done that, as my friend Milka sings then, it's only then that you can say cheers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jamal. Questions, please. Uh, no, uh, yes, Dr. Dhawan. Uh, uh, no questions from audience, but I would like to un uh, get answer from Dylan, sir. How to assess the that we have fixed the, our length of the fibula is fine, that we have not shortened the fibula. How we can assess per operatively? Yeah, the, this problem. Have a yeah, this problem always comes up in in the comminuted type three fractures, Weber C fractures. Okay, so there is no hard and fast way of doing it. There are so many radiological parameters. One of the things which you can do is you should always have in comminuted fibular fractures an X-ray of the opposite side. In the ray, if taken beforehand and put in the uh, on your view box. Because when you get the fibular length, you have to recreate the length to the same side. There's also so many signs like the dime sign on the lateral side and bringing it down almost to just above the lateral process of the talus. But that, there's a significant error of judgment over there. So what you have to do is, I would suggest to all people, have an X-ray of the opposite side when there is comminuted comminution on on the view box. Bring this fibular length almost to that time and hold it with some kind of temporary fixation, one plate with two screws. Then open the interior center screw. That's where you can also judge the accuracy of reduction of the syndesmosis. If the syndesmosis is accurately reduced, then pass two temporary stabilizing K wires from the fibula to the syndesmosis. Then I would go around, fix the posterior malleolus, maybe even fix the medial malleolus. And then I would be sure of getting a near normal length and a near normal rotation of the distal fibular fracture. Anybody uh, else yeah. has any other suggestions? So basically, but you know, it is not possible in the majority of cases and majority of settings to actually do a CT post surgery to actually re to assess. So the most of the surgeons actually tend up doing an assessment on CM, which is not a very good assessment. And then post surgery, they tend to compromise a little bit and accept what they've achieved. But Jamal, it doesn't take too much to give a small incision over the anterior syndesmosis and check it. And if I would put a temporary K-wire immediately that I know I've checked it, it's right. Then I would go around and fix the rest of it. So a small incision anteriorly can cut off, I won't say it replaces the CT, but it helps a great deal. You can plan, if you're doing a fibular plating through the lateral side, you can push your incision slightly anterior in the first place. It's only a different incision is uh, incision is required if you are doing it from the uh, posterior lateral approach. And then again, the main problem, if you've got an accurate posterior malleolar reduction, then the fibula is also partially brought down to length. So we have a strong ligament. So if we have that, then we can always get. A, so it's not one method of getting the fibular length and rotation right. It's the, the variety of methods all combined and give us the best accuracy we can get. Thank you, sir. We're actually running a little late. So could we go on to the case discussion? The first case by Dr. Arun Kapoor, please. Am I visible? Yes. Yes, yes. Or slide slow by Darlo. So we move on on the ankle. We've been talking a lot. After a show stop at Dr. Mandip Dhillan, it's rather difficult to be coming on, on the stage. Well, that's a job. We had a 32-year-old male, no comorbidities. Let's make a chart. And uh, this was the fracture that we have had over here. Looks pretty innocuous, does it? You need to read, go into it, and how you do you go ahead. Like we just had a 
insight into this double contour so there seems to be definitely something over here you have a fibula that is a little comminuted and of course the fracture fragments going up into the shaft the meta epiphyseal part generally pretty bad looking fractures when we go on ahead and generally these are high energy uh, injuries with lots of soft tissue involvement that is present went on to the ct uh, moderator sir if you do feel there is a discussion some point in presentation you can just stop me and we can go on if you feel we are running out short of time i'll just keep continuing uh, as if it's okay dr jamal yes sir please continue that's it okay so you need to look into it one of the places where you need to be extra sharp you need to span scan and plan one of those places because you have a lot of soft tissue injuries you go on ahead what i say would like on a red light you have a stop look and go look at it look at it in a way through your ct scans through your 3d reconstructions through your axial cuts you read what you have in hand and don't go on ahead you need to give due respect to the soft tissue also these were the 3d reconstructions the axial cuts all in front of you now how do we proceed for this particular region you need to be very systematic let me be pointedly very clear before you proceed you need to be very systematic because once you have planned only then you can use your uh, approach into what implant you want to get in what approach you want to give to your fracture you need to identify your main articular fragments and their displacements in this particular thing your main articular fragments are three in number i would come out of this a classically y shaped tri profound injury with a central fracture that is a depression you have an anteromedial you have a posteromedial a chaput and a workman's and a medial malleolar part getting back to what we have everywhere you need to look into your zones of communication combination and impaction you need to identify whether it is a varus and an abduction injury or a valgus and abduction injury in that case your approach and your plate fixation would depend on that particular injury you need to see whether you need to fix the syndesmosis or not believe me once you have gathered information you look into your information you understand what it is like dr dilan just said not all ankle are straight forward but you do see a path going on ahead like how you want to reduce it what fractures you have and how you want to reduce it now on this you determine your fixation strategy appropriate for this particular fracture it is anterior to posterior or medial to lateral you see what best area and the fragment to buttress what is the combination of implants for the metaphyseal part because this is a fracture extending into the metaphyseal part so you need to look at that simultaneously and then looking into all these things you choose your approach and that is where you start off with your surgery was oh, sorry to interrupt yeah we sure. just have to we just have to expedite it because we are running a little late okay sure i'll do that can i ask the can i ask the faculty how they would want to treat it before dr kapoor shows yeah, you yeah sure but that's, he that's actually exactly did. dr dhillan dr uh, gao how would you want to do it oh. ming how would you want to do it uh, i'll start very briefly uh, uh, jamal uh, i just make some points um, so i think with uh, with this kind of uh, pilon fractures uh, the soft the, mess, the first message i think that's very critical is soft tissue integrity is absolutely critical Uh, so, like Arun has pointed out, the plan, the the approach of uh, spanning, scanning, and planning, I think it's a critical point, and I think that those expectations need to be laid out to the patient right from the beginning. That this is a condition, uh, and this is a pathology that will take uh, a sequence of events, uh, and the planning of the surgery will really depend on how the soft tissue state evolves. So that's the first point. the second point is uh, like professor dilan had mentioned in the last presentation um, i personally believe that 
that trauma is the single and really the only uh, indicator of a post-traumatic ankle OA. Uh, I don't think there's this, this concept of idiopathic ankle OA doesn't really exist. I think we don't have the MMPs to drive it. And so trauma uh, and chondral injuries and articular reconstruction is very, very important. And so this patient needs to know the severity of the injury. Third point is, uh, I, f I think that in this particular case, taking a CT with the, the spanning external fixator will give a very different image. I think you get to appreciate the columns a lot better. Uh, and I think you get to see about, you get to appreciate the articular discongruence a lot better as well. And I think that will also change the way in which we manage uh, and approach this fracture. Um, in principle, uh, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate uh, to do two things. Firstly, a stage this operation. So even if I had to reconstitute or reconstruct one column first and then come back at a later date and reconstruct the other column, then I would do that. And secondly, uh, I would, in this particular case, I would probably incline towards using a fixator-assisted uh, fixation. So I would leave the fixator in place uh, on the medial side uh, and use that as a spanning device whilst reconstructing probably the fibula and the postolateral uh, tibia. Uh, and possibly the soft tissues are okay, uh, attempt the medial side the same setting, but if not, then come back at a later date and do the medial side, either with a long plate, uh, articular congruence, and post medial plate being the variance of combination. Uh, over to you, Prof. Dylan. I think Dr. Dylan is not there. Anyway, we can have Dr. Kapoor tell us what he did. So we proceed on to in two ways like uh, this i read my fracture in a way like what i needed to do i needed to buttress this chaput fracture fix the fibula first get your alignment right fix your chaput fracture back into this once you have fixed your fibula your workman's will fall back, into, uh, fall back into place generally speaking because it's a large enough fracture looking into this i do not seem to be having a syndesmotic separation. Once this closes and it's going to fall back like a book and that is what I expect. This is what I did. I took my anterior lateral approach for a anterior lateral plate, fixed my fibula, got. There are generally two ways of going around fixing this particular region. Either you do it in a staged approach as Dr. Gav has just pointed out. You stage it, fix your fibula first, go in later, get your articular surfaces right. Or uh, you can wait and do it together like I did it at about the 10th day when the wrinkle sign had come on, there were no blisters, and we went on ahead. Again, two ways of doing it. You get your articular reconstruction very precise and very secure. Your main aim of surgery here, as in all different places, is like a precise articular reduction and reconstruction is very paramount. The restoration of length, the alignment, and the rotation need to be perfect. You get a stable joint fixation. That needs to be good enough for an early joint mobility here. So there are two ways of getting on to fixing your uh, articular surfaces. And that is, you get your larger workman's, that is a large enough piece over here. Once you have got your fibular alignment right, your workman's fracture gets back into the piece, gets back into place. You fix that to the medial medullar part. Go in, you need to push down with your bone graft and then get your chaput back and then fix it to the diaphysis. Or at times, there are play times when you fix your diaphysial part first, then get back over here once you have re-articulated the articular part, convert a C into a B and then move on ahead. Or then a third part like I did, I got my fibula, fibula I fixed up both of them together, my diaphysis and my articular, fix them together. Because once those diaphysial long fractures are pulled back, uh, brought into places, the articular fragments are large. So I went ahead doing both together. I used interfragmentary screws. This was the exposure to anterior and fixed my fibula on the lateral aspect to the same, took care of the peroneal, interfragmentary screws. The most essential part, went in, pushed the plafond down, got a cigarette graft from a girdies and the lateral condyle part to this contraption. And uh, this is what I had. I had used these implants as the screws in a rafting fashion, the plate in a buttressing fashion, and a neutralizing plate because it does not need to be too long in this particular case after having used interfragmentary screws. So 
so this was my fixation and the result the patient was not too bad about it a perfect dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion and the scar tissue was pretty healthy and this was a three month follow up patient walking pretty nicely this was just recently done do i need to summarize because i think this time is short and i think i have put in everything that uh, you would want to put in that's a great tool like or anything that you want uh, to add to it you uh, how did you die punch that uh, that articular fragment with that device i didn't quite get that did you go through the fracture site yeah i went to the fracture site before having got the diaphyseal part first how do you do evaluate that you have restored the articular congruence is it i had i had taken an incision i had taken a me to see it I had taken on a little arthroscopy to proceed in the anterior part between the chaput fracture and the medial fracture I had just taken a little incision a window went into it used the talus as a base the head of the okay. talus is the base so that you did platform. that uh, you did that before you put on the anterolateral plate oh yes of okay. course yeah very nice nicely very done nicely done thank you very much any one wants to make any comment or we can we proceed to the next one so i have a question Sure. Doctor, how did you assess the reduction of the posterior malleolus actually? Because you operated all from anterior, and uh, it was uh, quite impossible to assess how it is reduced posteriorly. I took a view through this window. Whatever I could through this window, I went over here through this window. This is not a very large place. You can very uh, well look at the posterior surface over here. Of course, the uh, of course your image intensifier is going to tell you the rest. That's it. Once I had got my alignment right on the superior part here, you see this. This was a fragment extending back. The posterior fragment, the walk pants fragment, was extending up. And once I had this, that had to come back because that was a single particular piece. Yes, I, I didn't need to approach the posterior part because the plate plus uh, on the posterior part would have gone in right up to the diaphysis, getting that uh, stabilization. And that interfragmentary screws had already taken off care of that metal diaphysial part over there. And again, a neutralizing plate on the anterior part. Again, look into that. So, I think that's a good enough platform. I think that's a, that's a good point, actually, uh, Arun, because biomechanically the tensioning surface is posteriorly posterior, uh, and the compressive surface the compressive uh, surface is on the anterolateral side. So, biomechanically, it would make sense to put the plate on the posterior side, uh, but. Clearly, your articular reconstruction and your column stabilization here is is, is very good. Um, so I think, and I mean, of course, the other concern, but I think you have done it through one incision as well. So yeah, that's fine. Compartment syndrome is uh, and skin compartment syndrome as well is is lower uh, because of that. But the point I think was that uh, biomechanically, it may be better to put the plate at the back. Right. One second. Now, may I invite Dr. Ashish to present his case? Ashish, Ashish, can you hear me? Carry on. So I'll just. Uh, so. This is a very case. Uh, this of a 70-year-old elderly man presented same day of injury and had significant swelling at the time of presentation. This is not clear. This cost would be different. Am I audible now? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, I had this X-ray on the initial presentation, and that is having basically three components of the bony injury. We can see there is a comminuted fracture on the lateral aspect of the fibula, 
there is a comminuted fragment on the medial side and there is a comminuted but very small posterior malleolus fragment so what should be the line of management hello jamal can you hear ashish we can't hear you can you hear me sir yeah we can hear ashish i think we need to move on for ct if you have ct because ct is must in these cases so if you have ct you can go move on yeah sir ct i had but unfortunately i just missed it i will tell you the finding the ct it was exactly the same it was as it was looking on the x ray with one additional finding like uh i'm having i'm having a medial malleolus fracture which was grossly comminuted with small pieces there was a fibular fracture which was having a separate fragment uh at the level of syndesmosis and there was a small uh, posterior medial ma posterior malleolar fragment which was approximately about 7 or 8 mm so basically uh, scr type 4 injury and uh, which was having a additional vagastephy fragment हेलो आशीष यस सर आवाज क्यों नहीं आ रही नॉट ऑडिबल टू एवरीवन यू मूव अहेड डॉक्टर जमाल डॉक्टर जमाल आप इसको हटा दो आपको ऑडियो चाहिए विद अ प्रॉब्लम आई थिंक देयर इज सम प्रॉब्लम विद द ऑडियो ऑडियो ऑफ आशीष सो गुड नाइट विद द रियल्स टिल इट बिकम्स ओके कैन वी गो टू आशुतोषस केस आई थिंक वी शुड गो टू आशुतोष केस सो कैन यू प्लीज पुट योर केस ऑन यस सर अभी को मीडिया बोल रहा है सर सर आई थिंक यू स्टॉप द शेयरिंग सर आज डॉक्टर आशीष टू स्टॉप शेयरिंग आशीष यू स्टॉप शेयरिंग एट लीस्ट Yes. We'll take your case later on because you are not being connected to everyone. Ashish, I'm doing that, sir. Ah, okay. Sir, I'm audible. Yeah. Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I am presenting the case of 34-year-old male sustained injury of left ankle, chest, and head two months back. Head injury and chest was managed conservatively. Presented to us with complaint of deformity of a left ankle eight weeks post injury. On examination. the deformity was present over the left ankle the neurological status of left ankle and foot was normal the skin condition over left ankle and foot were normal only jog of movement was present to our left ankle this was a x ray picture 8 weeks post injury this injury was missed as patient for has a uh, head injury and chest injury and it was managed conservatively now we have got ct scan Yes, sir. So this can you see is a posterior malleus fracture, comminuted medial malleus fracture, and the lateral malleus fracture. Now, sir, plan. How will you proceed? Can we have the opinion of any faculty? Yeah, I can start, uh, Jamal. Uh, I'll take a very uh, this is Gao here. We'll take a very broad view about this. 
So this is an unfortunate situation. He's a 34-year-old who is two months post uh, trauma with effectively a, a sublux stroke dislocated ankle. So yes, uh, the purists would argue that the cartilage is here is probably compromised. Uh, and he probably has a degree of evolving uh, post-traumatic ankle OA already. Having said that, uh, in my, certainly in my philosophy, in my practice, uh, I would try and salvage any joint that I possibly can. Uh, and so rather than going with a joint sacrificing option, I would go with a joint salvage option. Uh, and that's the first point. Secondly, by going down that route, uh, the first thing I would probably do uh, in my practice is uh, to get an MRI scan, uh, not so much for any reason, but to give him an idea about the degree of cartilage damage. That's more prognostic information uh, rather than useful diagnostic information. Now, as far as reconstruction is concerned, uh, so I think if, can we just look at the original x-ray, please? Yes. Uh, so I think uh, I wouldn't do anything significantly different uh, as far as the reconstruction is concerned. Now, the medial side looks uh, very questionable. I'm not really sure on that x-ray and even on the uh, CT, which you glance through, uh, how much of a bone stock there is on the, uh, on the medial side. Uh, but assuming that there is still a viable fragment, then I would try and plate reconstruct the medial column. Uh, to reconstitute the stability on the medial side and the, and reconstitute the lateral column. Now, having looked at the CT more closely, there may not be adequate bone stock on the medial and lateral side. And if there is, there is the lack of the lateral and medial buttress, uh, then I'm afraid uh, a joint salvage option may not be possible. Uh, in which case, then uh, a fusion would be a better option. And if I, if I was doing a fusion in this guy, uh, I would probably go with a distraction device to get the soft tissues distracted for a short while. So I put on an external fixator for about 48 to 72 hours, allow for the neurovascular structures and the tendons to go back into position, uh, and then bring him back to the operating theater and do an arthroscopic ankle fusion. Uh, I'm done. Over. Ashutosh, how did you do it? Ming, can we have your opinion? Okay, um, yes. Um, the patient is very young, 34 year old, and um, there's no significant soft tissue uh, uh, problem and new water intact. I agree that I will try my best to salvage the joint if possible. So, um, I will study the uh, CT scan in detail whether this is still. Um, uh, remaining middle molarus and also the bone stock for the lateral molarus. It seems that this is convoluted, but um, for such a young age, having tried to um, uh, reconstruct the joint as far as possible on the middle lateral side and the posterior side. Um, sometimes it's a, uh, it may need uh, some bone graft if I try to restore the uh, ankle joint. But uh, it's, um, if not possible, yes, I think uh, one of the options is the uh, fusion. But um, I think this is the, the last resort for such a very young gentleman. For eight weeks, eight weeks is not um, too long. I, I mean, uh, it's, um, if the bone stock is still uh, OK and the uh, fragments are still reducible, fixable, then I will try this. Then, OK, that's my opinion. Okay, Ashutosh, could you proceed and tell us what you did? Yes, sir. So, so we, we discussed with the patient. We told him that he may need, he may have painful ankle post fixation due to secondary osteoarthritis, and he may need ankle arthrodexis in future if he has severe pain. He opted for uh, 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 open drug internal fixation. We tried to reduce the ankle joint and then fissure, but pain. To go for post little incision. Yeah. Release the posterior medullus, try to reduce, but fail. Then we release the lateral medullus, try to reduce, again fail. Then release the middle medullus. We, we achieve a reduction. We fix, then we fix the posterior medullus with T buttress plate, fix the lateral medullus with plate, and fix the middle medullus with two CC screw. 
and fifth it is sent to one screw a uh, joint with four mm screw we put only the uh, we fix it with three cortex only this is indeed post shop sir aap wo dekho ke chahe aap isko kholna to dono taraf se aapko pehle so this after three months sir aap pehle fix kar doge tab dusri taraf khologe tab kar doge so this after 11 months I think that's an excellent result, Ashutosh. I think that's a great salvage. Uh, can I just ask two questions? Yes, sir. You, uh, at the time of the uh, ORIF, yes. uh, did you have? And I know you mentioned a little bit about uh, trial of reduction on the medial side, and then on the lateral side, and yes. then again on the medial side. Uh, did you use any devices in particular? Do you use a femoral retractor or Hinterman retractor? Did you have traction of any other sort to help with the reduction, or did it come in quite easily? So we have put, so, so we have uh, taken put a shin pin and put a calcium uh, 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 shin pin and do a manual uh, uh, traction and uh, manual distraction of the ankle joint by uh, by calcium traction. Second question is uh, the bone quality during the fixation. I mean, the X-rays are usually quite deceptive, but when you were fixing them because they had been out for so long, for eight weeks, the bone quality during fixation, especially on the medial side, uh, was that amenable to screw fixation, or you, did you consider using a plate uh, as a buttressing device on the medial side? So, this is the the on the we bone we can feel on the middle side. So we opted for we 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 initially plan for plate fixation on the middle side, but uh, we we could get a good, a good chunk of bone. So we put only two screws. Right, right. Okay. Dylan wants to make a point. Yeah, uh, a small question and and a small point before I go for another meeting at seven o'clock. You see, if you notice the post-op uh, clinical pictures, uh, the patient doesn't have a dorsiflexion beyond neutral, which is very common with these ankle fractures. He's got good plantar flexion, but they always limit dorsiflexion. And if you look at the joint space, there is a reduction of the joint space one, and then there is a little bit of an anterior osteophytes already. So this usually happens because the cartilage which has been out of the joint has already got some damage over time, eight weeks or six weeks, however it is. And this is exactly what I said about the things which are not in your control. And these are the guys who are fixed well radiologically. But would potentially get early osteoarthritis. So you must tell the patient that although I've got a good anatomical geometry back, I never really had too much control over the how much desiccation that cartilage went through, how much was the impact on those chondrocytes, and how much was the cell death. This is not in our control. So even a well-fixed ankle, seven to ten years down the line, would develop arthritis. And the second key point here is. You must remember in ankles they almost always lose dorsiflexion. You must make sure that they don't lose dorsiflexion. Otherwise, there is a significant change in their gait patterns, and then they start getting pain. So just look at those two points very, very carefully. Thank you, boss. Thank you for your time, guys. It was a great. Meeting. So this is renal motion. Yeah. So you, yeah, it comes to neutral, doesn't go above. Get him to stretch that. Dr. Ashutosh, uh, just one query, it's not a question, just one query. When you were operating, how was the cartilage looking like? The cartilage, sir, cartilage was very soft. soft. Okay. The cartilage was soft. I beg, I can't hear you, Ashutosh. The cartilage was very soft. No, I know. It's not, but it's not in your control. How much was the impaction? How much was the desiccation because the joint was dislocated for a long time? That's not in the surgeon's control, and that is why even some well-reduced and well-fixed ankles develop osteoarthritis. I said in my talk, this is one of the reasons about the factors which are not in our control, which lead to a long-term uh, this thing. So you work on trying to get back his dorsiflexion in the long run. Otherwise, he's going to have abnormal stresses during gait, like we do uh, in the knee. If you have a varus, you have abnormal stresses. One part of his joint will wear out, and the ankle gets a lot of stress. A lot of weight pressure comes through it. So you try and work, keep it supple, hope for the best. Talk to this guy that over a period of time he may get arthritis. And it's not because of what you did; it's because of the nature of the injury. Thank you, Ashutosh. Yeah.
we'd like to go to the next case because we just okay. yasser your case okay uh, thank you ashutosh i just want want to add few point that just always remember when you are go, going from fibula to tibia don't use lag screws try and avoid lag screws because they put a compression force and that will create problem so you always try and avoid lag, using lag screws probably that comment from uh, dr dillon if he is there uh ashutosh i just want to make a comment it's gaurison here uh, so i'm a huge proponent of scope assisted uh, fracture fixations so like uh, prof dillon has said uh, yes we can't control a lot of the damage that's already been done but there is now an evolving body of evidence that arthroscopy helps to a wash out the joint so it creates a more anti catabolic environment b if there are any chondral flaps chondral uh, injuries you can debride it and even microfracture it at the same time these bone fragments loose bodies synovitis that's present can be excised at the same time and if at all nothing uh, it gives the patient a very good prognostic uh, milestone as to what to expect uh, in a lot of cases even like the case that you just showed where fracture reduction uh, can be slightly ambiguous and arthroscopy helps you uh, uh, reflect on the accuracy of the reduction so i think a bit like other parts of the body for example in the tibial plateau where a lot of people are doing scope assisted fixations as well i think the future in ankle especially high energy en energy transfer ankle fracture fixation uh, arthroscopy will be a very good action thank you thank you now yes sir please yeah i am audible sir yes you are you just have to hurry okay. it up okay sir uh, i am discussing a case uh, of a 26 years male patient who presented to us with injury to the right ankle and the leg uh, and the injury he present one day after the injury uh, the coming to the x ray of that patient uh, he was having a complete articular fracture of the distal tibia with large anterolateral fragment associated with the tibial sharp fracture in the distal third with intact fibula and the the soft tissue part injury it was a shernet tie grade 2 injury deep bruising around the ankle and the lower leg was present the initially uh, we diagnosed the patient as a case of this uh, island fracture with ankle subluxation right side with fracture lower third of the tibia initially we kept the patient in below knee slab for soft tissue healing after that uh, our plan was to do articular reduction of the anterolateral fragment and fixation of uh, this fragment with either a screw or the plate and uh, reconstruction of the medial column with a long plate uh, taking into care the distal uh, tibial fracture also this was our plan and uh, after 10 days of uh, this injury we went in and uh, do the job and this was the post op x ray we do double plating Uh, we opened the uh, anterolateral fragment through anterolateral approach and applied a uh, recon plate there and through uh, minimally invasive percutaneous plate osteosynthesis uh, um, stabilized the sharp fracture and the medial column this was the post operative shall i continue or is there at two weeks uh, this happened uh, at the time of the screw uh, stitch removal there was a uh, skin necrosis and a wound dehiscence occurred so at this stage uh, what went wrong with our uh, this uh, was it the timing of the surgery was wrong it was around 10 days after the injury and uh, the literature said uh, one to three weeks uh, may be the optimal time for uh, healing of the soft tissue injury either the approach and incisions were not uh, right or the implant choice was wrong maybe it uh, anterolateral plating would have done the job or the stage protocol mean the by temporary xfix and open reduction internal fixation later on will be the case shall i continue sir hello hello continue hello. okay okay so uh, then sir at this stage uh, when the the patient's wound was uh, uh, closed and we immediately contacted the our plastic surgeon who went went into in and they uh, grafted that part and uh, at the end of the 6 months uh, this was the post op x ray of the patient the uh, fracture united with uh, 
you can see the early osteoarthritic changes and uh, the stiffness of the ankle, the functional arthritis. The patient developed the stiffness. The patient uh, uh, hardly reaching to the dorsiflexion. So this was uh, our one complication which uh, I want to share that uh, maybe our uh, uh, incisions uh, were not adequate or some uh, endolactic plating may would have done the job from the single incision. From what we learned from this is that the pylon fractures along with ankle subluxation are associated with significant soft tissue injury. Even after delaying surgery for soft tissue healing, bone complications do occur as occurred in our patient. Stage treatment for protocol should be considered. Planning and execution of appropriate incision is crucial for successful outcome. Okay, Yasir. So, Gao, what actually went wrong with the first surgery? Why did uh, this happen no? after the first surgery? Hello. Gao, are you here? Dr. Ming, what actually went wrong with the first surgery? Why did it happen? No. Why there was a wood dense sense? What is your take about this first surgery? Ming, you can start or I, I can go if you want, Ming. You're, you're, you can go first. Can't, can't hear me. Um, okay, I think I did um, first. For 10 days, it's still um, not, I think uh, it depends on the soft tissue, whether there's a, a wrinkle sign and the suppose there's a, and the uh, receive swelling, blister, or a skin problem about if um, this wrinkle side is present, then I think you can proceed to the surgery. So yes, uh, for this type, whether it's um, ED, so uh, or severe uh, soft tissue injury to the uh, uh, soft tissue is a, uh, and also for the wound, for the, I think uh, this is full, um, for the middle plate is in uh, with the uh, is it uh, with a done by MIS or the uh, last wound? Um, uh, it wasn't too minimally invasive, of course. Minimally invasive, okay. It's small wound over the middle side, distal middle ankle region. I think it's for me, is uh, if the soft tissue is the uh, satisfactory during operation, and uh, in fact the implant is uh, not very proud, is uh, not a, uh, occupy much space. Whether there is a uh, excessive stripping of the soft tissue become a flap, and the anterior side may cause this sort of problem. And uh, whether there is a anterior post um, that we check the um, beside the the shift of the tibial and anterior will prevent such a um, wound problem usually because um, the tensor the, and the anterior side will be less while preserving the tibial and anterior shift to retract all the tendon shift to the lateral side. Okay. This is uh, some of the comments. Okay. With the elevation after the uh, surgery, they may help to decrease the swelling. Yeah. yeah. Look, can you show us the original x rays, please? This was the original exit of the patient. Yeah. So I think I think uh, so I think this is a great great uh, illustration of uh, the issues that can go on when you have uh, two incisions very close to each other. Very close to each other. Yes, uh, I do agree that the medial sided plate insertion is uh, done through an MIS approach, but the reality of the situation is you have one anterolateral incision, one medial incision uh, in the setting of, of trauma uh, that where the skin is already very tight, soft tissue envelope is already very tight. Uh, and when you put in the plates as well, even though they are low profile anatomic plates, they are going to increase the girth and the volumetric 
space around the distal ankle. So I think the wound dehesions uh, is really very much uh, related to uh, the choice of the incisions. The angulation uh, of the tibia is very classic. When you have an intact fibula, we all know that the tibia tends to drift into varus. Uh, and that's because the compressive surface on the, on the diaphyseal side is on the medial surface. Uh, and so it makes sense to actually restore the length on the lateral surface of the tibia rather than uh, put a long plate down the medial side. Uh, it's very difficult to say on this uh, exactly how uh, easy or difficult it is to reconstitute the articular congruence. Uh, but just looking at this x-ray uh, without the CT uh, and just being a devil's advocate, I do wonder if restoring the articular components with screw fixation and then nailing this uh, would be a better alternative uh, rather than going down the route of a long anterolateral plate. I am not a big fan of anterolateral plates because I think generally you have the same issue. The soft tissue envelope on the anterolateral side isn't great either, especially if you're fixing the fibula, which is not the case in here. But if you have a postural, a direct lateral incision, the fibula, you have another anterolateral incision, um, it's actually very tight on the lateral side. Uh, but I have to look at the CT more closely and extreme nailing may actually even be an option. But uh, there is also break on the medial side. Uh, we can take care of the anterolateral fragment by the anterolateral uh, small break. But how we will take care of uh, this uh, medial component of uh, tibial bilone fracture with? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's hard to say based on this X-ray, and I think you're 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 probably right. We may have you have you may have to reconstitute the articular surface uh, with screw fixation and then put a smaller plate. Uh, on the on the uh, on the distal side, and then another small plate further up, or just one plate uh, down the uh, lateral side, or stage it. That's the other thing that I would do. So I would put a small plate, build up the articular surface, and then go in later and fix the fix the diaphyseal side. Uh, can we go back to Ashish, and he can do it fast. So am I audible right now? Yeah. So this is this was the case I was a, I, I, I was supposed to address this. So I am having this uh, seventy year old male who presented on the same day. This X ray is having three components of the injury, bone injury. Medially he is having a comminuted fracture of the medial malleolus with very small fragments. Laterally also fibula is comminuted. CT did show there is a Fragment, laxity leaport, and posteriorly there was a, uh, a posterior medullus fracture, which was practically a ring fracture, not having the articular part in it. So now I have to uh, go for the fixation. Obviously, I waited for about seven or eight days till the swelling subsided, and then I planned my surgery. So I just wanted to know uh, the opinion of the house. What should be the priority of it? Priority and order of the fixation. This is what I did. Okay, for this case, I um, this a um, now Hansen is superficial rotating type, and for this I three fractures. Um, for this I will do the natural side first. Use an endocardial plate to fix the uh, distal fibula, and um, whether there is a CT scan to show the actual size 
of the uh, post-thermal wireless, okay? Uh, and um, I'm not having if possible, I will also fix the post-thermal wireless. And for the middle modulus, although uh, the size seems uh, not too big, I think it still can be fixed if we uh, use it with screw. If not, we use tenon band. Depend on the actual uh, configuration of the middle modulus feature. So uh, I agree with uh, Kwame, I've got nothing more different to add, except to say that, so I would do a postural uh, lateral approach. It'd be useful to look at the CT closely to evaluate exactly where that posterior fragment is. Um, it looks uh, like it's postural lateral, but it could well be a lot more central. Uh, but I would plan my fibula incision accordingly, uh, probably a postural lateral incision, restore the fibula rotation and length. I think that's critical and that would be my first step. And once you've restored that, uh, then I would certainly fix the back of the tibia for two reasons. Firstly, because uh, he's 70 and I think the stability will be hugely uh, advantageous if you fix the posterior malleolus. Uh, and secondly, I think it also helps with the rotation of the entire ankle. Uh, the talus tends to click uh, in and out of the mortise if the posterior malleolus uh, is still loose. Uh, and so I would fix the posterior malleolus ideally through the same incision. Uh, medial side, like, like Kwameng has said, uh, I would have the tension band uh, construct as a standby if I find that uh, screw fixation is not adequate. Um, and, that, and that's what I would do. Uh, 70 year old, um, my conventional practice is to keep patients in a back slap uh, for two weeks, allow the soft tissues to settle down and then get them ranging the ankle at two weeks onwards uh, and start full weight bearing at five weeks. But at a 70 year old, I'd be a little bit more conservative. Uh, I would still get them uh, ranging, uh, but a little bit later and get them probably fully weight bearing in a, uh, in a cam shoe or a boot at about six weeks. Ashish, we can't hear you. Ashish, you're muted. Okay, sir. So can we can we do one thing like if I'm not convinced that posterior malleolus is fixable, I, I cannot effectively buttress it, and there is a significant anterior fragment of the fibula. That's the vex lipoid fragment. So can we do that? I we fix the vex lipoid. And that will stabilize my syndesmosis. And if I'm not having any anti articular incongruity, we can uh, uh, go alone with the anterior fixation and leave the posterior. Will that do? <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ashish, you got to say that again. Are you talking about uh, fixing the, uh, the fibula comminution and ignoring the posterior malleolus? Is that the point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, see, the, pro the problem is this, right? Uh, firstly, uh, we don't know how big that posterior malleolar fragment is. Uh, I think you'd be surprised if it's a lot larger uh, than what it seems like on the x-ray. That's the first point. The second point is the actual stability of the ankle, especially uh, in the extremes of plantar, uh, in the extremes of ankle plantar flexion, where the PTTL, which is the posterior tibial tailor ligament, is lax. Uh, is very difficult to say. So even if you fix the fibula and get the lateral construct out to length, you may still find that the uh, talus subluxes subtly posteriorly uh, and it doesn't fall back into position. Now, if the medial side uh, fixation is not adequate, either because the bone fragment is too small or the, del and the deltoid is lax and the talus then starts to drift into a little bit of varus, uh, as, as a result of that, and you also start subluxing at the back, then you end up uh, with an x-ray at eight weeks or 10 weeks with ankle subluxation. So in a 70-year-old, I would have a much lower threshold to fix it and get it anatomically restored than compared to, let's say, a 35 or a 40-year-old who's got very good bone quality, 
where I'm very much more likely that the PITFL, which is the posterior lip of the syndesmosis, is still intact. Uh, and I keep the patient in a, in a neutral position so that the posterior malleolus heals in a good position and then get them ranging later on. Uh, but in an older patient, I would have I would do the right thing. I would fix it and get the patient ranging. Then I know it's done. It's not going to subflux it. Actually, I was uh, I planned it in a way like yeah, I'll I'll reduce the fibula. I'll re reduce the uh, evolution of the anterior inferior tibial tibial fibular ligament. That's the vestibular fragment. I'll assess the stability again after the completion of my fixation. And if I find that fixation in unstable, then I'll only I'll go posterior because I was very much concerned about the fact that I may not effectively buttress the posterior fragments. That was my only concern here. That's that's uh, that's why I did not approach it from posterior first. So what I did, I, I can show you that. Yeah, the problem is, uh, I know the uh, Chaput's fragment, which is the uh, antral lateral fragment of the tibia, which is where AITFL inserts into, that really helps with rotational stability. But it doesn't hugely make a difference as far as uh, anteroposterior stability is concerned. For anteroposterior stability, you need the posterior lip uh, of the plafond to be relatively intact, and you need the IOL and the PITFL to be intact. So fixing the AITFL, either by means of the Chaput tubercle or even less ligament reconstruction, will not necessarily give you the uh, sagittal plane stability that you're, you're looking for. So you're still going to put the same amount of stress through your posterior malleolar fragment. Okay. So uh, this was just the sequence of fixation. Uh, what I did was I reduced the fibula. I fixed the uh, a, uh, ATIFL, uh, AITFL fragment with the lag screws. Then I came onto the medial side. Medial side was having combination, but uh, that was a coronal split. Anterior part was a big chunk. I was able to fix it with one lag screw. And for the posterior comminuted part, I applied a plate, a hook plate, a very small uh, low profile hook plate that was two millimeters uh, from the hand system. And this was the picture I got. And I was absolutely uh, happy with the stability because when I checked on the fluoroscopy, it was a stable. But somehow I was, uh, I was a bit uh, skeptical about my anterior posterior stability because I did not fix the posterior malleolar fragment. So I just applied a syndesmotic screw to be on the safer side. So that was the final picture which I had. And uh, this is after about uh, one and a half month follow-up and ankle was absolutely stable. There was no subluxation at all. Yeah, no, I think, I think it looks great. I think it looks, uh... Uh, it looks good. I think there's no, uh, I think it's too early to say if you're going to get any uh, sagittal plane instability. Uh, what was your post-operative protocol? I kept him in a back slab for six weeks. And after six weeks, I started the ankle mobilization. After eight weeks, I removed the syndesmotic screw. And after uh, uh, eight weeks, I started the weight bearing. Okay. Yeah. So I think that will deal with any kind of uh, posterior instability. Uh, adequately, if you're keeping the patient a back slap for six weeks without any movement, non-weight bearing, I think that would be adequate. Um, great, nice, well done. Thank you, Ashish. So uh, now, Anupas, over to you. Um, I think uh, if everybody permits, I have another, uh, just a small uh, case discussion which Dr. Imran Akhtar wants to do. Imran, can you present your case? Imran? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you there? Uh, please please sir, stop uh, share the current uh, presentation. So we'll have just, this is the last small case which he has. He wants to have the opinion of house regarding this case. Thank you, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just Run, planning to... and your X-ray CT. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, th this is uh, this was uh, his current X-ray, 24-year male. Uh, 
and after three months, uh, this is the current X-ray, and uh, which shows the uh, fracture talus neck, which is completely extruded talus, Hawkins type three, and uh, this is the CT cuts, bilateral CT was done, uh, the left side is involved, and uh, this is coronal and sagittal cut. These are other cuts. These are the axial cuts. So this is 3D reconstruction views. The current, this is current skin, skin condition. Uh, neurovascular status, status and everything is normal. The current skin condition is good. I want to uh, ask the <clears throat> respected panelist to please advise me that uh, can this Taylor body be saved? And is there any uh, option of vascularized pedicle graft to prevent the avian of the talus head like uh, we do in uh, head uh, femur? And uh, ca can we do modified Blair fusion in this procedure or a tibiocalculinian fusion or uh, uh, any implant of choice or what backup implants we should keep? Ming, your opinion. Okay. Um, for this case, there is, um, okay. It's, um, there's no case of both ankle and the uh, superior joint. The tail is in the posterior part, posterior to the uh, tibia. For this case, I think first of all to um, assess any there was an injury and the uh, soft tissue skin problem, skin necrosis. According to your kind of photo, it seems that the, the soft tissue is uh, satisfactory without any necrosis. And then uh, and other is uh, I think um, for this I think I will try to reduce uh, the um, tailors. You I expect to use a usually open means. I think close means will not be successful. Um, for this, in some cases even uh, you can uh, you reduce it um, in the anatomical position and uh, and then uh, to uh, fix it back, uh, there's a high chance of AVN, but I think it's a very fun to do this, okay? Uh, although the uh, chance of AVN is very high. I, um, I'm not sure whether Andy Vasker graph is uh, helpful for this, but uh, it's even it's uh, very difficult to perform with this, yeah. For, and also for this case, uh, the um, Rate of degeneration is a uh, the OA change will be uh, high in this case, maybe uh, also complicated by uh, AVN with collapse, such, et cetera. Okay, yeah. but I think it's still worthwhile to uh, redo and fix it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Go your opinion. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Jamal. Uh, I think that's a great case. Um, uh, now, uh my personal view is that when you have an extruded tailor like that that is three months old, uh, th that's right, right? Um, the risk of uh, AVN, like Kwai Meng has said, uh, the risk of poor uh, bone quality to aid reconstruction and uh, the potential for male union and non-union uh, is very high. Uh, so we all know that with tailor neck fractures, even in an acute setting, trying to reconstruct the length and the rotation is very difficult. Uh, and when you have this sort of situation where the soft tissues are contracted, trying to push that tailor uh, uh, fragment back into the uh, ankle solace and reconstructing it is very tricky. So I would go with a fusion option. Uh, and my with a, even with the fusion option of the ankle, uh, you're relying really on the anterior uh, segment of the tibia as well as the tailor head and neck fragment uh, for purchase. Uh, because the segment or the space of the cavity beneath the tibial plafond is actually empty. So I would usually, with this sort of uh, case, I would do a two incision technique. Uh, so I would do two mini anterior approaches to help with the joint preparation in the front. And I would do a postural lateral approach to help with the Taylor head, the Taylor body fragment, which then gets uh, partially morselized, uh, removed. Uh, and then inserted in through the front, through the two mini anterior approaches to fill up the cavity, which is with as much pedicle bone graft as possible. And then do exactly like what you said, uh, Blair type fusion with an anterior plate construct. 
uh, which goes from the front of the tibia into the tailor head, the tailor neck, uh, and that helps to restore your tailor navicular articulation, but also to some extent your subtalar uh, sub alignment. Now, the problem with this is there's a relatively high risk of non-union. Uh, secondly, uh, you must warn him that there will be a loss of length or, or height. Uh, and, sec and thirdly, there may be a degree of weakness uh, as far as push-up is concerned. But I think this would be a better option in the longer term because for a young person, uh, reconstruction, I think, will potentially end up with a revision fusion within a year or two. So that's what I would do. Imran, do you uh, have to say anything on this? Uh, sir, uh, thank you, sir. Gao, sir, uh, is modified Blair fusion along with modified Blair fusion should we fix uh, uh, with CC screws the TBO tailor body also? Sorry, uh, screws for the TBO tailor body. I mean, the the tailor body, uh, I think if you push it back in, if you when you do your postal lateral approach to the ankle, if that, if that tailor body fragment is one big chunk of bone, uh, then I think it's excellent. Then you can, uh, with a Hinterman retractor, you can distract the tibia and the calcaneus and you can push the tailor body back inside and then fuse it pretty much like you would do any other fusion, but through have a screw construct going from the tailor head to the tailor body to reconstruct the body and then fuse it. But I suspect what will happen is when you go in, that tailor body fragment will be very morselized. It'll be mesh. Uh, so you will find that you're in taking, you'll end up taking it out uh, inside you, in smaller fragments. Uh, and then you may have to push it back in through the front to two small incisions as just uh, cortical cancellous bone graft. So there won't be much of a purchase there to put screws in. You'll have to put the screws in the distal tibia and the tailor head. Uh, and then expect that mass to fill up with bone graft or, over time. There is another option though, uh, Imran, uh, which is to use, uh, there's actually two other options. One is to use a femoral head allograft. Uh, which will which will reconstitute the step uh, or the gap, or the second option is to use a cage device, uh, which is like a titanium cage, uh, and to put in bone graft inside, or a third option, uh, which is something that Rajiv Shah talks about uh, a fair amount, which is to use a 3D printer uh, device and recreate uh, 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 an implant that we can put into there, which helps create recreate the space. The problem with all these three options is that uh, the first and second options, either the bone cage device or even the femoral head allograft, is the risk of non-union is going to be pretty high. So I think you'd be better off trying to uh, use the autogenous fragments and get best union possible uh, rather than putting in a foreign body. Uh, do you have any experience of Elizro uh, or doing an orthodosis in such kind of cases? Yeah. So I think a Lazarov is an excellent option as well. And I do it uh, usually in the setting of a TTC fusion uh, rather than an ankle fusion. Um, so if the patient has infection or AVN and has a talus that has crumbled or collapsed, then a, a really good operation is uh, to put two rings on the distal tibia, uh, one calcaneal foot plate, and then compress the distal tibia onto the calcaneus. And in fact, even lengthen the patient proximally to get the length back. Uh, the problem uh, I find with uh, with the Lazarov, at least the Singapore side, is uh, patients don't like it. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so, uh, the that I can actually convince to do that are usually the ones who have really bad infection uh, or the ones who had two or three operations and have failed. Uh, and then they would be amenable to having a Lazarov construct. But I think it's a very good option. I think it will work as well. So I think it's the time to wind up the whole show. Let me thank Dr. Go, Dr. Ming for uh, their time and the good discussion. Let me thank you all the other faculty, Dr. Mandeep Dhillan, Ashutosh, Yasser, Ashish, Arun Boss from uh, different parts of UPOA. And uh, thank you, Jamal, for coordinating uh, in such a good manner. Thank you, Apoor Boss and Dhawan Boss for giving us this opportunity. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ming, Go. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Well done. Very nice. Thank you.